Good. There's a lot of you guys I don't recognize. So uh, when you see me walking around in the hallway sometime, uh, come up and introduce yourself to me because I don't teach very often. I don't get to know the students very well. And the only chance I get is if you come talk to me and I, I start recognizing you in the hallways and then I'll say hi. So someday I may just walk up to you and say, hi, I remember seeing you. What was your name? And don't be afraid I won't bite your head off or anything like that, okay? Because that's how I get to know you guys. So it's nice to meet you all. Um, I have been here almost five years now. So I've, I'm, I'm getting a little bit more comfortable in the UCC tradition that this congregation is. I was ordained Lutheran. So this was a new experience for me to be here. And the idea of prayer here is similar, but like the Lord's Prayer that you just talked about, for instance, is different in different denominations. And in the Lutheran Church, we say, forgive us our sin or our trespasses. But here in church, what do we say? Do you know the difference here at UCC? What do we say? We don't say, forgive us our sin. We say, forgive our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And that actually is the closest translation to the Greek in which it was written. So the UCC uses the closest translation in the first place. So if when you're talking about the word debt, the word sin, or the word transgression, they all have a different kind of shade of meaning to them. But they're all talking about the same kind of thing. Our, um, the, our, what we owe our neighbor. You know, forgive us anything that we might owe our neighbor, even if it's a good word and we haven't said it. Um, not just monetary stuff, like when you think of debts, you think of money, right? A lot of the times. It's not just that, it's your whole relationship with the other person. And what does that mean for you? If you haven't totally given of yourself to the other person, then what's lacking there? And whatever it is that's lacking is what you're asking for when you say, forgive us our debts. Whatever it is we haven't been able to give, for whatever reason, forgive us that just as we forgive other people for not giving 100% of themselves to us. Because that's what it means to be in a relationship. Right? And that's kind of what sin is, is that separation. Whatever it is that blocks you from giving yourself wholeheartedly to somebody else in a, in a neighborly fashion. So prayer is all about relationship in that sense. Prayer is really important in helping to build relationships because when you speak to God in a conversation with God in prayer, then you can be honest, right? You can, you can open up yourself in a way that you wouldn't necessarily do that with other people. And so there's, you have nothing to lose, right? So you might as well be honest. And that's a, a ground of being that is a really safe place to be. Um, when you're praying for other people, however, you can do that in private, in the closets, or wherever it is that you do that. But a lot of times we do what we call intercessory prayer. And intercessory prayer means that you're praying on behalf of somebody else. Like when you're asking somebody, um, or asking God to heal somebody else, that's an intercessory prayer, okay? You're hoping that somebody feels better. That's what intercessory prayer is. You're praying on behalf of somebody else. Okay, so there are all kinds of intercessory prayers. What kind of uh, prayer what do you ever say or have you ever heard on behalf of someone else? What else would you pray for on behalf of somebody else? Besides like sickness. Somebody feel better, they're going into an operation. The death of a loved one. The death of a loved one. What kind of, what kind of prayer would you ask for for the other person? Hope they feel better and less lost. That it's hard to lose somebody. Please help them feel more at peace with that in some way. Help them to understand something that they really can't understand. So you're, help, you're asking for help on behalf of somebody else, right? Exactly, that's intercessory prayer. But there's also ways to do that, like for your government. How many of you ever prayed for whatever the future is of our political system? How many of you have ever prayed for the war in the Middle East? Have you ever heard that? Those are intercessory prayers. When you say things on behalf of other people, on behalf of communities, on behalf of 
uh, a whole world or a nation or any of those kinds of things, your school. When you're praying for other people, you're asking for God to understand with that relationship that you're in with the whole world around you and maybe just a specific part of it. So like when the Lutherans, for instance, pray in church, not only do they say the Lord's Prayer, but they do what they call uh, prayers of the community. And they offer up several different prayers on behalf of lots of people, people who are sick that week. Sometimes they list who's sick in the bulletins. How many of you have seen our prayer list on the back of our bulletins? Have you ever noticed that? Next time you're in church, look on the back of the bulletin. There's a prayer list there for people that have either been in the hospital or had a baby or, you know, whether you're praying because they're sick or whether you're praying because something good happened to them, like having a baby. Um, those kinds of things are on the back. So when you're reading those and you actually say their name in your prayer, you're actually praying on their behalf just by stating their name. Because by doing that, you're saying that you're in relationship to this person in some way or another. And you ask God to care about that with you. Right? So how many of you have ever prayed for someone else and got an answer from God? Anybody? Did you ever pray for somebody to get well and they did? Not really. Did you ever pray for somebody to get well and they didn't? Okay. That's probably more what you what you're used to. Probably it's it's almost miraculous, right? That if you pray for somebody that they actually get better and then everyone will say, "What a miracle." That's great. But part of intercessory prayer is understanding who God is in the midst of that relationship that you're having that conversation and what your expectation of God is. So when you pray for somebody to get better, what's your expectation of God in that? Who is God and what's God's power in that situation? What do you expect? What would you hope for? An answer. An answer. Preferably one that you've actually asked for, right? For somebody to get better. You know, that I, as a pastor, I go and pray with people all the time who are in the hospital. And there are a lot of times where what I pray for is for people to die. That's kind of a shock, I know, to some people. But in some sense, healing is becoming whole. And death is one of those ways to become in some instances. So that kind of expectation shifts around. So what does it mean to be healed? You have to start thinking about that. But also, you expect God to want the same things that you want, right? And so when you pray for somebody to get well, you're assuming that that's what God wants too, right? But what intercessory prayer does is just kind of connect you to God to say that you're in relationship with God and this other person. So you've got God, the community, and yourself in this three-way conversation. And what you're doing in that prayer is saying, God, please stand with us. When I mention somebody else's name, I'm not saying that I have the power to heal them. I'm not saying that I'm even right that they ought to be healed. What I'm saying is I care about this person and I'm standing with them just by praying for them. Because sometimes there's nothing else you can do but just be with someone when, they're, when they've lost somebody, a loved one in their family or something like that. There's no way to explain that. There's no way to understand that. Your presence of just being with that person is the support that they need, the love that they need. So that's the expectation is that you are standing with somebody else when you're praying for them. So when you're praying to God for that, what you're asking for, I think, in intercessory prayer, is for God to stand with you. Not a specific outcome, necessarily, but that you're in relationship together and you acknowledge that not only do you care about this person, but so does God. So the outcome is not the issue. That the issue is the relationship that you establish by making that prayer. Does that make sense? So, so for many people, they'll say, I've been praying to God forever and ever and ever, and I never hear anything back. And so they give up on God.
but their expectation is that God can solve everything and will solve everything and will constantly do it in a way that I understand. But I'm wondering if that's a fair expectation, really. So when you pray, I would like you to stop and think about what your expectation about God is in this. And if what you expect is for God to care about the person you're praying about, then I think that's a realistic expectation. But the other stuff is up to God. So to stand with you and know that God's in relationship with you and that other person is what intercessory prayer is all about. Because it's the desire to want to be in relationship that you're asking God to do. What God does as far as an outcome is really up to God, right? It's not up to me. I don't know. I don't, know. I don't understand it. The best I can do is just stand with you or to be with you when you need something. And that that's the support that we all ask for when we're in relationship with each other. Does that make sense? That it's not an outcome-based thing, it's a relational thing. That I'm your friend and I'll stand with you. You're not alone. I think you could think about it from the standpoint of, uh, what if you pray to God, please stop the rain, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's a prayer that affects you know you because you want to go play but you know if we stop the rain there's a drought farmers can't produce crops I mean it's devastating I mean it's you know not that extreme all the time but that is kind of what you're asking for stop the rain which will negatively affect somebody else and sometimes you're not always aware of what that negativity is because the relationships are so broad and so large that you don't even know what your effect is on other people a lot of the times. But it's there. So imagine if you have an image of who God is up in the clouds, right? And everybody's asking for a different prayer and they contradict each other. Then what? Somebody's praying for rain. The other one's praying for sun. What does God do? <sighs> kind of an unrealistic picture of who God is up there pushing buttons, right? Chris, I would just add another way that you could pray that's, that's intercessory and intercessory, I can't say that word, that's right. but um, that also helps you focus on your relationship with God through you to others is to just ask God, how can I be present for this person? Sure. And then God can be present through you. You're kind of asking God to direct your energy in a way that will support that person the most. Any questions on any of that so far, or any experiences you've had with prayer that you want to talk about or have questions about? No? For most of the, the times that I do counseling with people or pray with people, um, I find that it's really helpful, first of all, to start with who you think God is and what you expect from God. Um, because that will help you shape kind of the language that you use when you're praying with other people or when you're praying for yourself or when you're just plain having a conversation with God. And so if you see God as, you know, that, that kind of old man with the white beard, Father Time kind of image up in the clouds somewhere that's going to judge you sometime later for what you've done now, then what are you going to be able to ask God about? kind of narrows what you can talk to God about, right? You really don't want God to find out that you just stole your sister's record or something. Record. CD. Or, you know, something like that. You know, or anything. Her shirt. Or my sister used to steal my shirts all the time, but I always had all the records, so they came stolen. But, um, any of your stuff that's yours, if somebody stole it, you don't want somebody, you don't want God to know about that because you think God's a judge and you're going to get in trouble for that, right? So why would you talk to God about that? Is that really who God is? Somebody who's, who sits up there and waits to judge you later on? How would you describe who God is to you? What is your relationship with God? How do you see God? Name some ways to describe your relationship with God. You want to do that at their table? Yeah, that's something you can talk about. Um, I, but I do have an exercise I'd like you to do too. But that's what I'd like you to think about when you pray. What is, what is your image of who God is? To me, we talk about here at Countryside, the fact that God loves us beyond our wildest imagination. How many of you guys have heard that? Right? 
You are not alone. You are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Does that sound like a God who's sitting there waiting for you to do something wrong and judging you? Probably not. No, probably not. So if your whole image of God needs to shift a bit and know that it's a relational thing that there's love and that God desires to be in relationship with you, and there's really nothing you can do to break that up, that God loves you beyond all that stuff, then how do you talk to God? Is there anything you can't talk to God about at that point? Right. So if you think of a God as love and it wants to be in relationship with you, then there is absolutely nothing you can say that can shock God. Right? Absolutely nothing. And in Romans it says there is nothing that you can do to separate yourself from God. No matter what you do. God loves you first. And that's the point. So therefore, even if you're doing something that you don't want to do, or you're being a kind of a person that you don't want to be, or somebody else is being a kind of a person that you don't want them to be toward you, you can talk to God about those things. So intercessory prayer on behalf of somebody else is, could be as easy as saying something like, God, please help me to understand what it is about this person that's being so mean to me that makes you love them. Because I know that if you love me, then that means you also love them. Because I'm just as bad as they are in lots of ways. So if you could love somebody like me, then it's likely you could love somebody like this. So what is it about this person over here that you love? Help me to see that in them. So that I can understand what's lovable about them. Because I want to love too. Sometimes that's an intercessory prayer. It's on your behalf as well as their behalf. It's opening that relationship up a lot. So last week, while you guys are down here, it wasn't last week, it was a couple weeks ago, but it doesn't matter. We do those speakers upstairs in the commons area that come in and speak for a little while. And the very first person that we had this season was a woman named Tanette Powell. And what she does is she works with race issues in school for kids, as well as her own issues that she does for society and the legislature and all that kind of stuff. But one of the things she does is counseling in schools on racial issues. And she deals with kids that um, are suspended a lot, um, get in trouble a lot, have all kinds of back issues that you know most people don't even know about when you see them. But once she counsels them, she gets to hear some of those backstories about who those people are. And so she can understand them a lot more than anybody else who just kind of sees them walking down the hall. So what she said that she likes to do in those situations is when she comes and talks to a group of people like this, she gives them name tags, like you would if you were in a group, right? And instead of asking them to put their name on it, what she asks them is to sit for a while and think about it and think about what it is you need. Like, for instance, there was a girl at her school that somebody mouthed off to her just as a normal, you know, kind of everyday mouthing off thing. But that day, she happened to be in a really bad mood. And she, and she hit her. She struck out and she hit the other girl and was suspended for it. But everybody asked, you know, what is it about this girl? What did she do to you that incited this? Well, the girl did nothing to her more so than any other day. It was just that this day was a bad day for her. And no one bothered to ask her why. And it wasn't until she went to the counselor that they peeled back layers and layers of what was happening to this girl. And they finally got back to, well, what happened to you in first period? Nothing. I just went to class. Well, what happened in the class before that? Nothing. I just went to class. What happened before that? Well, I got, came to school. Who took you to school? My mom. What happened to you on your way into school? Her mother had yelled at her all the way to school in the car about how terrible a person she was and how she wasn't living up to her expectations. She was stupid. She didn't clean her room. She didn't imagine getting yelled and screamed at in the car all the way to school. And then once you get there, you're supposed to be nice and friendly to everybody. But no one had bothered to find out that story about that girl before they suspended her. They just assumed that somebody had done something to her to incite her and she was just that kind of a person. So then she was named 
right? A bully, even though that's not who she was. So instead of a name tag, Tunette Powell then goes around and asks people to say, what do you need? And in that, that kid's story, what she would have put on her name tag would have been my mother's acceptance. That's what I need. So it's not just I need a new car or I need a new phone or I need a new, you know, that kind of desire, but rather sit and think about it for a while. And what are some of those deep things that you wish for? You know, I wish my friends would understand me more. I wish my friends would um, understand why I want to be in the theater as well as in football or, you know, anything like that. It could be relational kind of stuff. It could be something that, at home. And the idea is that you need to share your vulnerability with people, the things that you don't always share so openly, so that other people can pray for you and they can understand some of the backstory so they don't judge you without knowing who you are. So just a name doesn't always do it, but a desire does. It tells something, someone something about you. So I'm not asking you to share your deepest, darkest secrets, but I'm asking you to think seriously what you wish you had. More friends? Do you wish you had somebody to talk to? Do you wish, you know, that you were more independent or had more courage? Anything like that. That, it, that tells something, someone else something deeper about who you are rather than, you know, just what you had for breakfast or what your favorite band is. Okay, so I'm gonna pass these out, and so two things I want you to think about before you write this down. One, what's your desires, deepest desire kind of thing that you can put on here, what do you need, so to speak. And then also stop and think about who do you think God is? What's your image of God in your mind before that you would ask God for what you need? So the, think of whatever you're gonna write on here is, what would you ask God for? yourself, for yourself, and then write that on here, okay? There should be enough for everybody at the tables.